Are the Cleveland Cavaliers coming back? Paul Pierce returned to Boston. Isaiah Thomas says he's good in LA. It's early, but eyes are on the NBA MVP race. The St. John's Red Storm is making a push. Will Vince McMahon's XFL get off the ground? Le'Veon has his eye on a special someone. All that and more on What's the 401 Sports coming right up. Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. I'm Mike McDonald. Good to see everybody as always. So we're just going to jump right into it and we're going to talk about the Cleveland Cavaliers. By the end of the NBA trade deadline, the Cleveland Cavaliers made some big changes to their lineup. New look, new Cavs. And how did they handle the, cha the changes, you ask? Mike, they went out the next day, beat the Atlanta Hawks, by uh, the score of 123 to 107, and then two days later, traveled to Boston and gave the Celtics the business by beating them 121 to 99. Mike, when all is said and done at the end of the season, and maybe if you want to talk about right now, do you think the Cleveland Cavaliers, a little bit of a tongue twister there, made the right moves? They did. Whether or not they wind up winning the Eastern Conference, uh, Keisha, I say this with a lot of confidence. I think that these were some moves that they had to make. I say that because of the new energy that we see from LeBron James, this sort of refurbished attitude that he has. He seems a little bit more upbeat and excited about the uh, you know prospect for the rest of this season. Isaiah Thomas wasn't necessarily working out for Cleveland, and I think you have to give credit to general manager Kobe Altman, Kobe Altman because what they did was they made all these moves in the offseason, and instead of they corrected their wrongs, they admitted their mistakes, and they said, look, all these guys that we wound up picking, off, picking up in the offseason haven't necessarily panned out, and I think that the Cavs had to make these moves. It could blow up in their face a bit, Keisha, because if they wind up not getting back to the NBA Finals, people are going to be saying, well, maybe if you didn't make all these moves, then you would have been able to get back to the finals. But I think from my standpoint, these were some moves that they had to make. Well, I definitely thought they were really great moves. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was actually surprised by the amount of changes they did to their lineup. You know, I kind of felt bad, a, a little bad for Isaiah Thomas. It's been a tough part of the season. He's coming back from his hip injury, and he only played about 15 games and really wasn't in full basketball shape and really not able to be the Isaiah Thomas that we saw in Boston. And then also I'm sure that on the Cla the Cavaliers, his his role changed where he, maybe he didn't have to be who he was in Boston. So, um, you know, he, he's moved on and so hopefully things will work out better for him. But as you mentioned before, the Cavaliers have gotten better and younger with all of these changes and that's exactly what they needed in order to really solidify what I think is their ticket to the finals. I don't know, I, I don't, I'm not going to say I don't know. I don't believe this team will beat the Warriors who we automatically just penciled in to the finals, but this was the right move and I think that if they don't make it to the finals, I think there is a little built-in excuse already because of all these new pieces, young pieces, a lot of these people that they acquired are young and haven't had playoff experience, much less really competing for a championship. So there might be a little bit of a built-in excuse should the Cavaliers not make it to the finals. Absolutely. Well, Keisha, you know, we stick with the NBA because recently the Los, Los Angeles Laker fans were chanting, we want Paul while beating the Oklahoma City Thunder. It's still early, Keisha, but do you think that when it's all said and done, Paul George will wind up leaving OKC for the LA Lakers? I think it's going to be a tough one. I, I'm, I'm torn, honestly, on this because there are compelling reasons for him to stay in OKC. OKC is a contender now, and they're starting to really take the form that I thought they would have when I thought about the moves they made during the preseason. I, they're really starting to form into a, a contender in the West. Not that they can or will beat the Warriors in a seven game series, but they're built to win right now. Whereas the Lakers are not. They are not going to sniff the playoffs yet. And they probably have another two, three years before they're really competing for an eighth spot and maybe up. But uh, L.A. is an intriguing prospect for him. Paul George is from uh, California, I believe not too far from L.A., and has openly expressed desire to play for that storied franchise in 
the Lakers. And Magic Johnson, who I just love tremendously, and he's really starting to, I think he's really starting to take his role in and make the moves. He's cleared a lot of cap space. So I believe that they have, they, the Lakers, have room for two max contracts at the end of the season. One could be Paul George. The other, I mean, LeBron's name has been bantered back and forth as a possibility to land in L.A. So I think if L.A. is able to land a superstar, it's going to make that package more attractive for Paul George to want to leave OKC. Yeah, I think from Paul George's standpoint, you know, you have to sort of, the guy's from, like you pointed out, he's from the West Coast. He would has this sort of urge where he would want to go home. I think that a lot of this comes down to Russell Westbrook and Russell Westbrook being able to sit down with Paul George and say, hey, listen, we're probably most likely not going to be able to afford you here in Oklahoma City. Not that Russell Westbrook's a front office guy, but maybe if the two of us can do something where we take a pay cut, we try to sort of develop something here over the course of the next several years, this is really going to be our best shot at winning a title. I and mean, if you look at the Oklahoma City Thunder, and I remember specifically talking about it here on this show, they really struggled at the beginning of the year. They have turned it on enormously though over the course of the last month month and a half they've been playing some pretty good basketball they've had some tough losses here and there but there is no question that they are a threat now as far as Paul George's intentions only he's really the one that's going to know whether or not he really wants to wind up going to and from leaving OKC going to the Lakers but I think is you know for the most part as we let this play out I'd like to see him stick in OKC for the next several years, make a little bit less money, and try to go at it with Russell Westbrook where they can kind of get that, that title that neither of them have gotten in their career. Yeah, I think I would like to see their big three stay together for a couple more seasons to see how far they can really take it. Right, but, I never even mentioned the, oh, Carmelo yeah. Anthony. Oh, poor Carmelo. It's kind of a, like, <laughs> an uh, afterthought, but he's still a very integral piece of the puzzle in OKC. Damian Lillard dropped 50 points in 29 minutes against the Sacramento Kings. Now, uh, his coach, Terry Stotes, thought that Mr. Lillard's services were no longer required in the fourth quarter, and Damian sat out. So, Mike, do you think that with basketball players, when they score 40 points or more and the game is in hand, that they should be sitting? I don't. I think it's good for the NBA to leave them in the game and let them go at it, whether you're the home crowd or whether you're playing for the home crowd or you're on the road. This is what people want to see. Look, especially here in New York where you have the Brooklyn Nets and the Knicks who are struggling, if you go out to a basketball game and the team is inevitably, inevitably going to lose, you want to see the opponent from the other team. If he's going to go ahead and score, if he has 48 points and the coach pulls him after the third quarter, you don't want to see that because you know you're going to lose anyway, and you've got to get Give it to these players, these stars. You got to give them an opportunity to go out there, shoot it out, and score 70, 80 points. And the last thing I'll say is, on the professional level, that's my standpoint. But when you talk about high school and and little league and little young kids playing basketball, at that point it gets crazy. You got to pull the kids because if you're beating someone by 50, 60 points, and one of your best players has 47 points, and you want to leave him in there just to see if he can get 60 or 70, it's not fair to the opponent that's getting crushed. Hmm, interesting. I'm going to go the opposite way, and I'm going to err on the side of caution, specifically with the Portland Trailblazers, because right now they are in the sixth position in the Western Conference. That means that they are in the playoffs. If the playoffs were to end, they're in the playoffs. But they're at six where an injury to someone like Damian Lillard or C.J. McCollum, his teammate who dropped uh, 50 not too long ago, um, an injury to either one or both of those could just kill their playoff hopes. So I think that if you take the long-term vision and what that is, and if it's to make the playoffs, I think that there's no need for them to run up the score. So Damian Leonard can say, I scored 60 points, 70 points. Well, you don't get extra points for that. It's not like there's a playoff system and because you scored ex you you scored this many points then that bumps you up a couple notches right. or you, you know it, it, so it, it doesn't matter it's nice i guess for bragging rights but nah sit down take a seat relax yourself and then just let your teammates carry carry you home <laughs> 
it's time to satisfy your appetite with a little bit of quick bites. On Sunday, the U.S. women's hockey team defeated Finland 3-1 in their first round of action during the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games. And Mike, we have a clean up on aisle five. NBC had to issue an on-air apology to clean up the mess created by Joshua Cooper Ramo, in which Ramo effectively stated that South Korea owes its progress to Japan. NBA great Paul Pierce went to Boston to have his jersey retired by the Boston Celtics. Mike, notably absent from the festivities, was his former teammate Ray Allen. Isaiah Thomas was a victim of the Cleveland Cavaliers overhaul, but he has found a new home with the Los Angeles Lakers, and he couldn't be happier. After his first game with the Lakers, Isaiah Thomas expressed his joy by saying, quote, I felt like I got my powers back with this team, end quote. Now another casualty, Derrick Rose was waived by the Utah Jazz after being acquired by the Cavaliers. Rose still may end up with a new basketball home as reportedly the Timberwolves and the uh, Wizards are reportedly interested in Rose. And congratulations goes out to Toronto Raptors head coach Dwayne Casey who notched his 300th win when his Raptors beat the Charlotte Hornets 123-103. to No other coach in Raptors history has as many wins as Dwayne Casey. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. Mike, the season is still underway. We're about halfway through. And now people are starting to form their opinions about who should be the NBA MVP of this season. Mike, who are your top five players to get that honor? Well, I think Kevin Durant and Steph Curry have to be in the mix. And, of course, Russell Westbrook and LeBron James. But I would think that um, with the way that he's played so far this season and the way that what we have going the rest of the way with the numbers that he's put up, I think James Harden is the guy that's going to wind up bringing home the hardware. Now, with J LeBron James having these new guys coming in, if the Cleveland Cavaliers can turn it around to a point where they wind up getting that number one seed in the Eastern Conference, which if they do, that would be a staggering record going for the rest of the season, then I think LeBron James could wind up getting into the mix. <clears throat> but I think that with Russell Westbrook, they got off to such a poor start at the beginning of the year in OKC that they can hold that against him. And with Kevin Durant and Steph Curry playing on the same team, it sort of balances out their performance a little bit. So I think that those five guys for me are the main five. And, I, you know, James Harden at this point has to be the clear-cut favorite for the rest of the way. Well, I am pulling for LeBron James. I mean, I honestly think that LeBron James could be the MVP just about every season because of the value. And that's what the V in MVP stands for is most valuable player. And LeBron has such value. Think about what happens when he joins your team. You win because he is that just out of world talented. Um, and if, like you mentioned, if he can get this team with this n these new parts around him to the finals, then I think that's going to be one of his greatest accomplishments yet. Um, I agree with you, James Harden. I've got Kyrie Irving. Kyrie Irving is balling with the Boston Celtics and really is part of, you know, the reason why they are able, the Boston Celtics are still uh, sitting amongst the top in the division. Now, they had some uh, tough times in, over the past couple weeks, but I, I anticipate that Kyrie Irving will uh, right the ship because this is what he wanted. This is why he left Cleveland. He wanted to be that alpha man. He believed in his talents that he could be the face of a franchise, and he is out to prove that he is right to bet on himself. Um, I have CP3 in the mix. I think he probably gets overshadowed by James Harden, but there's a markedly, there's a great difference, um, or a difference, or he's definitely has added value when he's on the floor uh, for the Rockets. And then, you know, there, I got stuck at four. So I just kind of poked around on the interwebs, and I just thought, who else, what other names are being circulated around? And I saw the Greek Freak's name bantered about. I think this is be a very interesting choice, but I think it's going to be dependent on how far Milwaukee gets in the playoffs. So Greek Freak could be the dark horse candidate. Certainly. Well, Keisha, we move on to a very disturbing story because with a splash, WWE chairman and CEO Vince McMahon, he recently announced his plan to relaunch the XFL in 2020. Then 
The other shoe dropped. A police report surfaced about McMahon showing his nudes and trying to, settle, to force himself on a woman in a tanning salon in Boca Raton, Florida. Will the XFL have a relaunch, Keisha? And if so, should Vince McMahon be connected to the league? Well, I think ego is going to dictate whether the XFL relaunches. And I think his ego, as a matter of fact, I don't think, I know Vince McMahon's ego is too big for the XFL not to relaunch at this point. He had a press conference. He declared how it's on its way back in 2020. It's going to have this, it's going to have that. It's going to be better than it was before. So I think that it will relaunch. Now, I don't know... Uh, it's going to be a tricky PR move to have him still connected with the, the relaunch. And his PR team is going to be putting it to overtime because this is the same person who boldly declared that no player in the XFL will have a criminal record. And now we have a police report where he's showing his nudes and he's forcing himself on a woman in a tanning salon. So what moral ground does he have to, to declare that nobody can have a criminal record so i think that it's going to go for it he's going to be connected now he vince mcmahon himself said he will not be the face of the xfl but should this relaunch really take off we'll see if he's able to keep himself behind in the shadows yeah i think um Without a doubt, there's going to be a relaunch. And you know what? As far as the XFL is concerned, there couldn't be a better time for them to have a relaunch with the way that popularity in the NFL has drastically decreased over the last year or so. With Vince McMahon, absolutely, there's a lot of hypocrisy with the press conference that he gave where he's singling out saying, you know, we're not going to have criminals. We're not going to have, you know, all these people. No that if, if you have a, Exactly. And then here it is where they, they, they've, you know, acute, this woman has accused... 10 years ago, and now the story has come out where he was um, involved in this sexual assault case. Um, I think that in a lot of ways he has to be involved with this because he's the one that's the driving force of how you're going to market this league. Now, is there a way for the XFL to detach themselves from Vince McMahon? Possibly, but I don't know as far as the naming rights and the copyright, if they would have to change the name and all that. Uh, without a doubt, let's, let, let's be honest here and, and, and clear, Vince McMahon and this is going back to, to you know when he became famous with the WWE. Um, the guy's got he there's the sleaze factor is very very <laughs> high. There's no question about that. Um, and it's not just this one circumstance where he had with this woman down in South Florida ten years ago. Apparently there have been some other instances as well. Some very controversial stuff with Vince McMahon. Um, it's going to be tricky to see how this moves forward. I don't think when it comes down to it that the XFL will wind up with, when it does relaunch. I, don't, I can't see it being that popular because, you know, it, 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 I can't see it really succeeding. And at the same time, a lot of people will probably be able to see Vince McMahon for what he's worth. Yeah, it's going to be tricky for them because they have, uh, they, there's a there's a. Sp Base that they can capitalize on because it's going to happen after football season and people and football is still king even though the ratings have gone down football is still king and there is a market that of people who miss football so if they can somehow create a marketing plan a marketing strategy to capitalize on that and then with the people who didn't want to see the kneeling and any political debates during the three hours of football, they're there. So it's going to be interesting to see how and if the XFL can capitalize and reach that pop that population. Well, we've got a lot more to get to, including our New York sports report, so keep it right here. Our photo of the week is of Brooklyn Nets point guard Spencer Dinwiddie shaking hands with his former teammate Trevor Booker, who was recently traded to the Philadelphia 76ers. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Mike, we are in the New York state of mind. And why? Because it's time for our New York sports report. Now, we talked earlier about the Cleveland Cavaliers and the moves they made by the tr trade deadline. But Brooklyn Nets also made a couple moves. And they recently acquired Dante Cunningham. And he's going to add some veteran leadership and some defense to the team. Mike, I ask you, we are in the sec coming on the second half of the regular season. And the Nets are really progressing, and they're further along 
this year at this time than they were last. What do you think will happen as we move towards the end of the season with our Brooklyn Nets? I think things will improve a little bit. I know that it's going to be difficult for them because they're at the bottom of the barrel when you look at the rest of the NBA. But there's no question that this team has drastically improved over the course of the last year or so and we've seen a lot of improvement from Kenny Atkinson the way that he's handled this team on a daily basis um, look it's it's still very difficult for the Nets because they still have so much ground to make up for from the front office blunders that have caused them to be where they're at right now and they're making up a lot of ground but I think when you look at the rest of the Atlantic Division with Philadelphia uh, who's obviously one of their main rivals. Listen, the, the Philadelphia 76ers were by far the worst team in the NBA a couple of seasons ago, and here they are right now really going ahead and making a you know a drastic improvement and actually pushing for the playoffs. So as far as the Nets are concerned, I think that there are some better things on the horizon for them. I know that the fact that they're roughly 20 games below 500 is is very troubling, But let's keep in mind that this team was so bad last year. If you compare the statistics team-wise from now to last season, there has been some improvement. Yeah, I think that the Brooklyn Nets, this story is going to be progression. They have progressed from this season, uh, from last season to this season, and I expect the trajectory to still go up and up. And like you mentioned before, the, the organization has been handicapped in a sense because of moves made by the previous regime. And it's going to, I think after probably this season, next season, they'll begin to own some of their draft picks. And I mean, I think Philly is not the only people who should be trusting the process here. Brooklyn Nets, they have a process, they have a plan, they have a vision, they have the right people in place. This team is starting to gel. They're getting some more stability, which is really going to allow Kenny Atkinson, the coach, to establish his lineup, his rotations, and defensive and offensive scheme best for his personnel. So I really think that the trajectory, the the future looks bright for Brooklyn. It's just going to take some time and patience from ownership, front office, and from the fans to really just hang in there and see the ship turned around. Well, Keisha, we move from one basketball team in New York to another. We go up over the Brooklyn Bridge and then <laughs> up to Madison Square Garden where New York's Knicks, New York Knicks center, Enos Cantor, had uh, really been ever hopeful that uh, the Knicks would be able to make it to the playoffs this season. And then, of course, with Kristaps Bazingis going out for the season with this torn ACL injury, Cantor and Nick's faithful are really losing hope. So, Keisha, I ask you, are the playoffs completely out of the question for the New York Knickerbockers this season, um, and should they just prepare for next year? Yeah, they're done. (laughs) They're done. Um, I'm just dropping a hammer. I'm calling it right now. The the Knicks are not going to make the playoffs. So what they need to do is start thinking about their future. And, one, they've got some draft picks coming up. Who do they like in the draft? I read some where we're Marvin Bagley from Duke what what it should be on their board as a possible complimentary piece to Chris Stapps move him Chris Stapps to the five and let Bagley play the four position um I think they need to decide what they're going to do at the point guard position they have Frank Nilekina right did yep. I pronounce it right? <laughs> and then they acquired Emmanuel Moutier during, uh, before the trade deadline. And then you have Jared Jack. So what are you going to do in terms of the point guard position? Um, and then I think you, you start to think about what you want to do long term with Chris Stapps. This is an injury, a serious injury, one that he can come from, come back from, but he is a little injury prone. And I've been reading and, and listening to a lot of analysts and commentators saying that because of his frame, he is prone to more injuries than most. So do you want to still build with him as the centerpiece for your future? And then also, there's questions about the head coach. Is Jeff Hornacek the person to um, steer this team in the future. I don't, off the top of my head, I don't recall um, if this is his last year or he has one more year after this season, but that's another decision that the Knicks have to make. So th- it, now it's more about planning for the long term. Yeah, I, I like with what you ended with, with Hornacek. We spoke at that about, about that as well briefly off air. And I think it's not like, one thing with the NBA is, it's, it's like in the NFL and also with baseball, 
there's always big names out there that you can bring in to, to sort of replace somebody. And I don't see that as much with the NBA because a lot of the prominent coaches that we've seen over the course of the last 10, 15 years have really just taken up the majority of the championships, like Greg Popovich and Phil Jackson. If you look at it, they probably won like 11 of the last, whatever it is, <laughs> championships over the course of the last how, however many years. But I think that, as you pointed out, everything that you said about the players, I completely agree with. For me, I think a lot of this is with Jeff Hornacek. How does he handle this second half or, or you know, last, what, two-third th- of the season that the Knicks are now facing where it's going to get pretty ugly, and how is he going to be handling this? And if, in fact, they do wind up making a coaching change, what are the options that are out there? Who can they bring in to replace them? The Porzingis, Mark Jackson. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> the Przingis injury really is troubling because I think, let's face it, I mean, aside from Carmelo Anthony, who was here for four or five years, seasons, and then the Knicks let him go, uh, Przingis was the one lone bright spot for this franchise, and seeing him go down is very difficult, and it can be very tricky for them to overcome this as they get ready for the next two, three seasons for how they prepare to get this kid back on the floor. But I think right now, it's really, you know, we know James Dolan's the owner, the general manager's in place. I think the big thing here is what are they going to do with Jeff Hornacek as the head coach? I think that's a big issue for them. Why don't you guys tweet us at 401 Sports TV? Who you think uh, should be the next, the next Knicks head coach? Who you think the ne- the Knicks should be looking at in the draft? Tweet us four hundred one Sports TV, and let us know what you think. We want to know. We want to talk, and we want to hear from you. Well, also, Keisha, we go to college basketball for a little bit because the St. John's basketball team was really having a rough time this year. I mean, they got off to a putrid start, but. Basically, they had they actually had no wins against the team in the conference, which is the Big East. Then all of a sudden, they just have come on um, unbelievably. The Johnnies upset, I hate to say it, your Duke Blue Devils. I mean, you really had to bring that up, didn't you? <laughs> and then they also beat Villanova just last week. So Keisha, now St. John's fans here in New York and all across the country are hoping that this team will perform, perform well during tor- tournament time. Well, they did get a couple signature wins, one at the cost of my Duke Blue Devils, but that's fine, that's fine. We're just going to move on to the baseball diamond. And the New York Mets invited Tim Tebow back to their spring training camp. Meanwhile, in the Bronx, the New York Yankees added their own star power when they acquired the services of Seattle Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson. Now is the time where we take a little detour and go off topic. Pittsburgh Steelers running back star Le'Veon Bell is a beast on the gridiron, but that doesn't mean he doesn't know how to shoot his shot. Le'Veon recently told TMZ that he would give anything that R&B star SZA wants if she would just be his valentine. We're going to keep you posted on what happens with this story. Now, Mike, we have to say goodbye to our friends, and I gotta say goodbye to you too, because you don't go home with me. But don't worry, you can keep up with us until we meet again by following us on Twitter and Instagram, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, All at 401 Sports TV. Also, be sure to download our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and TuneIn. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, we'd like to thank you for joining us this week, and we'll check you out next time.